Welcome to the Bio Balance HealthCast, episode number 403. Frequently asked questions from men about testosterone replacement. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We've started in recent uh, health casts that we've done a uh, discussion of frequently asked questions that people come to the office with about hormone replacement therapies. Typically, we've divided them into uh, questions that men ask or that women ask for the men in their lives <laughs> yeah. uh, and questions that women ask. Today, we're going to revisit the conversation in terms of looking at men's frequently asked questions. And the first one that we want to begin with mm -hmm. is how do you diagnose uh, low testosterone in men? So we have, we have a combined protocol. We look at both blood work. The, the blood work that we receive, the testosterone level, and some other... Uh, so you have a panel of blood tests. There are yes. like what, 8, 11... Different, Se 17. 17 different things that you measure right. before I ever come in. Right. Yes, I do. I get that filled out. I come in and I sit down mm -hmm. and say, all right, why am I here? Well, and we just want to save you time. Yes. We don't want you to have to come in and talk to us. Unless th those already give indicate. us all this information right. when... We can look at a written piece of information mm -hmm. and your blood work and then have you come in and know all that about you and treat you the same day. We, we're, we're skipping an appointment and hopefully saving you money. So saving you have, you you'll as have a all the blood money. work that gives you a significant amount of data that helps you make a decision. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you want to know from me, and you actually will have that in advance as well, mm -hmm. uh, is I will fill out paperwork that identifies any symptoms that I've identified that are of concern to me. So blood work plus symptoms mm -hmm. equals a diagnosis of whether you need replacement of uh -huh. testosterone or if you're younger, whether you need stimulation like with uh, HCG to stimulate your testosterone and, and no replacement or if you don't need anything at all. If maybe your symptoms are from that you perceive as from testosterone deficiency, they may be from something else. Mm -hmm. So, so we can see that ahead of time, and we're prepared for uh, a course of action by the time you sit in front of me. Well, and that's interesting because sometimes the something else involves a referral to another physician mm -hmm. for a treatment of a different issue, mm -hmm. and a lot of times that's identified in the seventeen different blood panels that you have tested. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and we're looking at general health. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at all your hormones, hormones from every gland in your body, because they all work together. So sometimes we find people who have low thyroid. We so, find people who have low cortisol or high cortisol. So there was a period many years ago when I went to a urologist and they said, okay, you're, you're having some sort of issue with uh, production uh, of testosterone. Of testosterone. Mm -hmm. And they taught my wife to give me shots. And they gave me shots every, mm -hmm. I think, two weeks Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, but I had to get a shot regularly, and uh, I mean, she and the nurse had a great time figuring, teaching her how to give me the shot, and it was a which little is humiliating, but <laughs> she was having fun with it. It's better than you trying to give your shot yourself. Yeah, oh, I agree, I absolutely agree. But my question then is, how often would I need pellets if I'm going to come in and we make the decision oh. that you need testosterone? I mean, I remember having to take those shots. And I also remember that at the time, like my mood would cycle up and down, right. which was one of the ways that we knew it was getting close to time. You know, well, I get we, all teary or upset We don't or use angry. shots. I mean, that's, right. not, that's not something that we use for multiple reasons. One is it's not bioidentical. It's not exactly like what your body makes. Mm -hmm. And it does have a variation of, of your blood level. It goes way up and way down within two weeks. And then you have to get another shot. And so that right. makes we, you... We track, I mean, conversationally, anecdotally, we track that. So so if you have a shot, you feel good for the first couple, you know, maybe the first week. And then it starts dropping. And then you have to wait and get another shot. Yes. So 
that isn't really good for your body. Your body needs the same dose every day, and that's what pellets provide. They provide a dose so every four to six months. So when you get your pellets, your dose, your your blood level goes up and stays essentially the same for five and a half months, and then it starts dropping, and then we redose. When it starts dropping, as it starts to drop, we redose because we don't want to dose you when you're at your highest, right? Because then we're going to get so for the camera, we're going to get high high levels of, or normal levels of testosterone, and then we dose you when you're here. It's going to go up, and you're going to keep going up. You're going to be adding to the dose, and and we're trying to get you to a physiologically normal level a level in your blood that both removes your or stops all your symptoms, but also is between 400 total testosterone level um, and 1,500. So it's not a, a surging uh, stair step. It's more like a bandwidth. It stays within a range. Right. It goes up, starts coming down. We redose, goes up, comes, and, and we try to keep you within that range, try to keep you within the range of, Normal, healthy men between 20 and 40. So are there ever circumstances where a man might need to get pellets within a four to six month window or, or less than? Less than six months. Uh-huh. Um, we have, yes, that's, there, there are men that need to have uh, their testosterone done uh, more frequently. One reason would be if you, if you uh, stimulate your blood count, and you make too many red blood cells. Okay. So by doing your pellets um, more frequently, we don't have to raise your blood your blood level of testosterone so high. And and it is dose dependent. So when you make a lot of red blood cells, you sludge your blood. So what that does is it kind of it makes it harder for your heart to pump. It makes you have possibly clotting problems because your blood gets very slow as it's uh, going away from the heart. And it's just not healthy. So testosterone in some men makes that, uh, makes your blood thick. So we have them give blood and then we change how often we give their pellets so that we don't get such a surge at the beginning. So how do you know that? Do you have a blood. blood test that measures that or? Yeah, we, we look at, well, we look at their, um, your blood count, your H and H. Okay. And we want the H and H to be the hematocrit, which is the percentage of red blood cells, to be less than fifty percent of your total blood volume, and we want your hemoglobin to be less than nineteen. So, if you're suspicious that that's what's happening to me, then you just do within that six month window, you do an additional blood test to measure a snapshot of where is your blood with this. Right, and there's some men that have to get their blood drawn several times to get down to normal uh -huh. even before they've started their testosterone. Okay. They just have a familial genetic reason to have a high blood count, but we can still give them testosterone. And it's a high red blood count. Yes. Okay. Excuse me, high red blood count. Yeah. So that would be that's called familial erythrocytosis. I'll remember that. Oh, sure. I bet you will. <laughs> okay. So so that's so that's one of the reasons. Another reason is some men blast through their testosterone. They just use it up so fast. Does that have to do with their activity level or their metabolic rate or both? Or I mean, Both. And, their, and the number of the medications genetics. they're on. Ah. So if you're on a, um, many drugs that go through the same enzyme system, the P450 system in your liver, you often will blast through your, um, all of your, your meds and your hormones because it, your body is adjusting to all of those medications it has to get through the liver and it speeds up the enzymes. And so you, so basically you have to take a higher dose of everything. So the pellets that you put in somebody's hip or flank mm -hmm. dissolve over time. And as they dissolve, they get put into the blood system? Right. So, so the question is, what happens to the pellets yeah. after they're put under the skin? So, right. so pellets That's are... That's a more artfully way to right? put it. So pellets are... Um, they're, they're a pressed powder of pure testosterone. Okay. Okay. And so, and it's pressed with a uniform pressure, uniform size for a dose. So, so the surface area, if you know physics, surface area is the same on every 100 milligram pellet or the same on every 
200 milligrams. So right. it's it's the size that often determines how fast you dissolve it and what your blood level ends up being. Every person's a little different. That's why we have to do individualized treatment. We have to give you a dose that we think is going to be good for you for four or six months. And then we have to retest to make sure it lasted. Right. And or maybe it could be even too high. So we drop the dose. So there is some element of trial and error in the first two doses. Okay? Right. But what happens is the pellet gets placed in the fat. This the hormone is fat soluble. So the fat around it dissolves the pellet like licking a lollipop. Mm -hmm. And that goes into the capillaries, into your bloodstream, and you which, are able to Which is to, how it gets to the liver to get in the, what was the it goes to the liver after you use it. Uh -huh. So you use your testosterone, and then as it's circulating, it goes back through the liver. So that's why pellets are actually better. If you have testosterone that is oral, God forbid, or a cream or a gel or something that is going through your skin or, or going through your stomach, mm -hmm. it goes to the liver first. And it makes a lot of estrogen when it goes to the, when liver. It goes to the liver. It so, converts. And so before you even use it, right. it's going through your liver. It's called the first pass effect. It goes through your liver and gets broken down into estrogens. Okay. And those are the opposite of testosterone for men. They actually help. They actually make your testosterone level drop. They the bind up your testosterone. Mm -hmm. So you can't use it. So when you use these gels... You get more more testosterone, you feel great for two weeks, and then you get more estrogen, then you feel bad. So they up your dose. Yeah. Then it then you feel good for two weeks, bad for two weeks. And then so you have those surges. Eventually you give up because you're taking ten times the dose or six times the dose and you're only feeling good half the month. So if I if I come in and I get pellets inserted and I get off of the shots or the creams or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't get the surges, I get a consistent flow. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for that to start working? It takes between, I mean, I've had men say, mm, I felt great the next day, but that's unusual. In general, it's four weeks for the blood level to actually get to a place where your testosterone is actually making you get rid of your symptoms. It's at a high enough dose. With men, it's a little different than women. Women have no, t usually we're treating women who have almost no testosterone. Uh -huh. So their their ovaries have um, gone into senescence, which is they they like go to sleep, don't work. So they have no testosterone really. So what happens is, for women, we give them testosterone and we're replacing it. We just have to wait for the blood level to come up. For men, what we do is we give them testosterone, and whatever they're making is suppressed. So there's a period of time where they're decreasing their own production while this is going up. So that's a little different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will feel in the first couple of weeks a little worse before they feel better as their own blood level comes down. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I think so. To me, it does. Mm -hmm. Because I, I work with a lot of patients who've taken antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And years ago, with, when the SSRIs were new, mm -hmm. they, they would tell us, warn the patient that It'll be 11 to 15 days before they feel an effect of it. Right. It has to before, build up the it blood It has level. to build up in the bloodstream. And, mm -hmm. and your explanation is the way I understood that explanation. It's the same process. And what's different with a pill, say you took a pill of anything, it, it has what's called a half-life. The time it takes for half of it to get out of your system. Mm -hmm. So the half-life will probably usually be the dosing schedule. In other words, if you dose it every 12 hours, that's how long it takes for half of it to get out of your system because we don't want to keep building up a level of medication you take every day. Right. So basically it goes up and down every day. So, so that's what's happening with a pill. But this is different. This is like what your body used to do, what your testicles used to make. It's, it's a natural reservoir. Right. It's an on-demand system right. as your body needs it. Because it tracks that bandwidth, mm -hmm. and as it starts to fall low in the bandwidth, it's, it's it just sends it dis more. It dissolves. It's not quite as good as what God did for us, right? <laughs> because that that system between our pituitary and testicles was an amazing system. But this is almost we're almost there. And if you exercise a lot, mm -hmm. 
you use up more testosterone. So we ask you a lot of crazy questions like how much do you exercise and how much, how long do you sleep every night and things like that because that affects the dose that we give you. And it seems like that's not relevant, sure. but it is relevant because we're trying to figure out a dose that's perfect for you so that it will last six months so that all your symptoms go away. Then you will feel more like you used so to you when you were 30. You don't only look at the symptomology they present with and the blood test. You you look at their lifestyle. I have to. Because if you don't if you don't have a physician that asks you those questions, then your dose isn't going to be the, be right. Right. You have to know that about your patient. It's very individualized. This is not a, you know, send 40, 40 yeah. people in through through you know your office and give them a shot and send them out. Right. This is I have to know what that person does, what they do for a living, how much they I mean, if they sit all day. What their stress or they, levels are. What, yeah, their stress. If, mm -hmm. if your cortisol goes up because you're stressed all the time, then you're going to need more testosterone. Right. If you have, um, if you work nights, then your diurnal schedule for your cortisol is off and you're going to need more testosterone. If you are a man and you're 5'7 and you're very thin, then I decrease dose. If you're over 6'2 and you are way over 250, I have to increase dose. So you have all these little formulas in your so head, plus I have, one, minus one, plus. Exactly like yeah. that. I mean, that's how that's how it feels. It's like, okay, so we got we go up, we come down, we go up, we go Like you a know. card counter in Las Vegas. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what it's like. It takes yeah. a lot of experience to be able to figure out what dose each person, person should have. And I'm not right every time. Even after 16 years, I'm still not right because they always fool, they, they can fool me. Their metabolism of their liver may have been activated because at some point they had liver disease, some hepatitis, they're now over, or they had fatty liver and now they're thin. And I mean, things that I wouldn't necessarily ask them and they wouldn't know if I did. That, exactly. They wouldn't I was just know say, the answer. A number of men are not self-aware about how their body responds to things in the way that women are self-aware. We've that's been right. trained not to be. Oh, ignore that. You know, just well, suck it up. Well, that's true, and that's Go not on. fair for us to do to boys. Well, but, but, it, but it's reality. It and is. when men come in, my age men who've mm -hmm. been raised with those those mm -hmm. protocols come in, and you you ask me, well, have you ever had this? Have you ever suffered that? I look at you and say, you have to ask my wife because I don't know. Well, there's a thing on your um, iPhone. Yeah. Which is your medical <laughs> history. Yes. yes. Your medical history has a little heart on it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know your own medical history, have your wife fill it out. Yeah. And you That's can, helpful. And it is, it is very important for you to do that for life-saving. If you, you have your blood type in it, you have your donor, if you're going to donate organs in it, right. you have your, your next of kin in it. But you have all of your information. You can just hand that to your doctor. Your cell phone? Yeah. Yeah. And say, and but, say and well, here actually, it is. Actually, one of the or you most can important it. reasons to do it is if you're ever in an accident and you're unconscious, emergency personnel, they pick, and you have a cell phone, they pick it up and look at it and they can, even if you have a code, they can get into that, that one particular thing, thing mm -hmm. and see what medicines you're allergic to, what you take, what your name and address are. Yeah. So this is even, it's off it's subject, a smart thing it's to off do. subject, but it's really good for guys who can't bring their wives with them and who don't pay attention to their own health, don't remember what surgeries they've had. And then yeah. and if their wife can't come, then they have this information right there for yeah. whatever doctor they're seeing. It so is helpful. It is helpful. But I'd rather have their wives come because then they, you know, they tell me if they snore, if they have obstructive, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, which could be affecting their sleep and it may not be testosterone. Yeah. You know, low testosterone affects your sleep. It makes you not sleep well, you wake up tired, and but so does so does so uh, sleep apnea. Yeah. Sleep apnea. So I have to sort those out. Okay, we're going to continue this conversation in subsequent podcasts, uh, both for frequently asked questions that women ask and more for men. So uh, hopefully that you find these to be informational, and you come back and listen to the next ones. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin 
and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.